Thanks for coming. Uh, welcome to the technology and transportation session. Uh, I know what you're thinking, that that's a pretty broad topic. Uh, so you're right, we probably will only gloss the surface of some of those issues on, on how uh, technology and transportation inter interconnect and how it's changing um, transportation planning and how people interact with transportation. Um, but the, the two speakers today have some excellent information and uh, I hope it, leaves, it leads to a lively discussion um, and a Q&A following their presentations. Demographic shifts and advances in technology are shaping the future of transportation systems and our relationship to those systems. As the baby boomer generation ages, many are seeking a lifestyle with less reliance on automobiles, and Generation Y also appears to value driving less um, than previous generations. With increasing more, increasingly more options to choose from and access to information at our fingertips, how users interact with the transportation system is drastically changing. The use of this new technology can also provide a treasure trove of data that can be mined to gain insight on actual travel behaviors, allowing us to plan more efficient transportation systems and gain a better understanding of how these systems are utilized. Today we have two speakers who are at the forefront of analyzing the interaction of technology and transportation. Um, please join me in welcoming Joe Schweiderman and Ron Milam. Uh, unfortunately, Susan Zielinski from SMART could not join us this morning. Um, but um, both Joe and Ron uh, are going to give some great information. Joe Schweiderman is a professor of the school, uh, in the School of Public Service and the director of the Chaddock Institute for Metropolitan Development at DePaul University in Chicago. He has testified before sub, uh, the subcommittee of the U.S. Congress on several occasions and is the author of Behind Burnham, A History of Planning for the Chicago Region. His work on the growing use of por uh, portable technology among bus, rail, and airline passengers has been featured in many national news publications, and he has a Ph.D. in public policy from the University of Chicago. Ron Milam is the principal in charge of techno uh, technical development for Fair and Peers. He is a certified planner with the American Institute of Certified Planners and a certified transportation planner. During, the tw during his 20 years of experience, 20 years plus of professional experience, he has completed a wide variety of planning studies throughout the Western U.S. and published over 25 professional papers. And he's the lead instructor for the UC Davis Extension programs, the intersection between transportation and land use. Ron is currently developing transportation analysis guidelines for Caltrans to aid in the evaluation of projects, including how analysis techniques to address climate change and working on GHG tools handbooks for FHWA. Um, let me just get through some quick housekeeping issues. Uh, as you know, or hopefully know, uh, we are offering AIA um, credits, and at the end, if you want to make sure you sign the paper to get those credits, it's at that back table in the corner. Uh, there's the course description. Here are some of the learning objectives that hopefully we'll cover. And now I'm going to turn the time over to Joe. Um, We'll start with you this morning, and uh, if we want to hold questions until after both presenters, uh, and then uh, we'll open it up to the floor. Okay. Go ahead. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Richard. This is a, a great crowd to, to describe the research we're doing that's uh, literally, uh, you're the first ones to see it. And we've been working on it for about three or four months. We're going to release it on Tuesday, so if you like uh, media in the crowd, just contact me and we can arrange for you to be part of our release but it's uh it's a really fun topic because it's it it gets to the root of what's happening with how people make travel decisions and why there's just a plethora of good news for people who advocate for public forms of transportation particularly a uh, bus train you know commuter commuter services uh, but the dynamics are changing, and what we're trying to understand is how the revolution in personal tech is changing the way people perceive their travel experience and the way they make decisions on the margins. And, and we'll see here that, that public forms of transportation have a real new edge that is, is, is making for some very exciting results. Before I get to that, let me just say a few words about what my institute does. We are the Chaddock Institute for Metropolitan Development. 
We're part of DePaul University. We're right in downtown Chicago, just two blocks from the Art Institute and a few blocks from Millennium Park. So we're right in the thick of things. And we do uh, probably three or four major studies a year, most of which focus on this idea of how people live urban lifestyles and how urban lifestyles and transportation interact. And to give you an example of the three big studies besides this one that came out this year is we have become kind of the, the center, I suppose, of all things on the inner city bus industry. Some really exciting things are happening. Megabus came to California last year, doing very well. Uh, Bolt Bus in the East Coast, there's been an explosion of inner city bus service. And people of my generation remember when taking the bus was sort of a source of shame. Oh, you must not have a car. You, why are you in Greyhound? There must be a, you must be desperate. Now we're seeing a great recovery and we quantify what's going on in that sector and it's, uh, it's, we find it's been the fastest grow, growing mode for years. We also did something uh, I think kind of fun or media friendly last year as we ranked Chicago suburbs by how transit friendly they were. We went to the commuter rail stations, we critiqued the, we looked at the walk scores and the amenities and we even put the stations to a white glove test to see how clean they were and ranked the suburbs and uh, Chicago really is a, a great laboratory to try our new index and we did some work on, on the capital needs of our transit system that's, that's come out and I described Salt Lake and Chicago as sort of polar ends of the opposite spectrum. We have an old system that needs capital overhaul little discussion about expansion here in Salt Lake it seems you got very little old stuff to maintain and you got all kind of new stuff to show off um, and it's a really fascinating contrast so uh, before I get to the the meat of my results is kind of the two branches is how market innovations we explore affect urban mobility and we're just intrigued at, at how uh, we're talking this morning about some things in California that are happening that are not been on my radar screen. In addition to the inner city bus service, we're, we're intrigued at what's happening with car sharing. And just this week, our local car sharing organization, IGO, got bought by Enterprise. I don't know whether to be happy or sad about that. It's an interesting thing. But one thing we did was say, why are we taxing car sharing like it's a sin good? In most cities, we find there's at least a 15% tax on car sharing because rent-a-car taxes apply. And we say, well, if you want to promote urban lifestyles, you can't penalize people who want to live those lifestyles and do car sharing. So our work on the taxes on car sharing has gotten a lot of attention in the New York Times and some other sources. And there's finally some movement to, to cut a break, do what Portland does, and, and exempt the sector from taxes. But I'd like to talk to you today about something we started in 2009. And it began when an old, older guy came to me and said, Joe, I remember when riding trains in the 60s, they were all old people. Young people didn't want to get on the train because they were trapped. Once you're on an Amtrak, pre-Amtrak, once you're on an inner city train, you're stuck. There's nowhere to go. And I remember riding Amtrak in the 70s. We would jump out of the station and buy a newspaper and bring it back in the three minutes so we would have some connection to the outside world when you're on a day and a half trip. And now that's all changed. Now it's the young people that are riding public transportation on Amtrak and so forth. And he said, I think, Joe, it's because they're privatizing their public space. They're taking this public space and they're bringing their private life with them. And they got a bubble around them. They got their device. They got their photo albums online. They got their movies. They got their Facebook. And they have their own private space about them that makes them feel very comfortable. On a, you would never consider 30 years ago. Um, uh, doing the things people do today, balancing your checkbook, sitting on a coach seat. But today it's, it's become kind of the norm where we do those kind of activities. So we're seeing uh, something happening out there and it's never been quantified. Amtrak is hitting record riderships. I mentioned about the inner city bus. Um, Amtrak, despite some pretty bad on time performance, seems to keep in a lot of corridors, seems to keep setting ridership records. Uh, heavy rail, things are happening. Chicago's hit a record on, on our rapid transit routes, and we know there's all kind of factors. High fuel prices, of course, that's a big factor. Um, you know, the employment issues where young people can't afford cars, yeah, that's a factor. But there's something else happening, and I think quantifying it is really interesting, and New York is, is a great example of that. So what we have done uh, uh, in our studies, 2009, we began sending teams out with real tickets on buses, trains, and planes, and to observe what people are doing. And we use handheld devices, 
texting devices to record how people are spending their time. And we began this again about four years ago, three and a half years ago. Uh, right now we have surveyed 25,000 unique pasture observations. I've only done probably about 500 of those because it's, it's, uh, it's uh, our teams go out and do it. We've now hit 410 trips, 10,000 observations. And we do this without notifying the bus company or getting permission. We just use our right as a consumer to observe very non-discreetly. Non and we record three things what people are doing. Are they, are they not in a, engaged in a device at all? Are they engaged in an audio activity, such as listening to music, or um, talking on a cell phone, or are they engaged in something that's audio-visual that involves an LCD screen? So they're, they're engaged in something more than the trivial task of, say, changing a song on, a, on an iPod. That would be just audio, but if they're looking at something. And now we have a new category, are you using a tablet or an e-reader? And that's been easy up until this year where the the definition of what's a smartphone and what's an e-reader start to morph where there's a lot of things in the hybrid. And we've also done smaller studies where actually go out and try to measure if is it an iPhone, is it an Android, but that's really tough without being intrusive. But we have done a bit of that to get a sample. So in the last three months, and we have a couple of our co-authors here, I got Ryan Forst in the audience who's probably done about 30 departures this year, I think. And uh, we've done 23 flights, we buy real tickets, uh, 24 Amtrak trains, uh, 16 inner city bus, 22 curbside bus, mainly mega bus, and 32 commuter trains. And we uh, get a sense of our observations over the year. They've held constant at around seven or 8,000 over the past few years. Uh, the first two years, we did the whole United States for bus and train. We sent teams out to California, to the East Coast. This year, we work in a five, six state Midwest region for the bus and train, because we couldn't find a significant difference. They were very close around the country. So we've just done the Midwest uh, since then. And um, the hard ones are the curbside bus, because I have to send a team, a single person actually, all the way from Chicago to Detroit and back for the mere act of collecting data for about 15 minutes. So they bring lots of novels with them or their devices and, and you know, but Greyhound and Amtrak, you can, you can do this with a random technique where they're only on the train or bus for, say, an hour. But uh, it takes a lot of time and it's, there's no other way to collect the data. Now, first thing I want to describe is how the use of electronic devices changing. And we all know they're rising, but one thing we noticed early on was that there was a substantial difference between tech use on bus and train and on airplanes. And that doesn't even account for the fact that the devices have to be off on short flights close to 40% of the trip for, for airplanes. So airplanes have always been the sort of technological wasteland, you might say, where it's very tough to get much done on your device on a plane. But we're seeing now things are changing as devices change. And I'll get to our, uh, our comments on that in a minute. But here's the data. And what we measure then is if you look at a randomly selected point, uh, meeting some criteria, how, what share of the passengers are engaged in electronic activity? And you can see here when we began our research in 2010, our first you know, data collection was complete, about 34% of Amtrak passengers were engaged. And you notice that every mode every year has had a nice decline. And this year for the first time, Amtrak, we have had more than half the mode of transportation's passengers engaged in devices. Uh, we have seen a decline in audio activity. Cell phone talking is declining, but audiovisual activity is rising sharply. Um, you notice here on uh, the airlines is always lagged behind the other modes dramatically, but there's been some of the largest increases we've seen yet on, on airlines to 35 percent. But the gap is still dramatic. And of course, discount bus for years was the top. This year, things have leveled off a little bit with megabus. We think largely because the clientele is getting more, uh, less affluent and less young. They're a much more diverse clientele. And the digital divide is falling. A company like Greyhound, which was at the bottom of the pack, now is seeing extensive use as devices become more pervasive. Now, the data itself is interesting in a, in a, in a, just looking at it alone because these are astounding declines. We are in an age right now, I think, that's not a whole lot different to when computers first sort of surged onto the scene in the, in the middle 80s, where suddenly all society was focused on getting a computer because you need activity. 
Now the, the push in electronic devices is nothing short of astounding. That I think in the next two or three years, we'll start to see this level off a bit because the penetration of sophisticated devices is occurring at a rate that is like something we haven't seen before. Now, let me describe some of the differences by modes. Uh, we did a commuter rail uh, analysis. In fact, we, we did the you know, 32 departures. And trains have a real problem. They're very tough to get Wi-Fi to work. Amtrak is facing PR problems out east uh, with the Acela Wi-Fi. Um, California has been saying it's coming to the Capitol Corridor, and I don't know if it's on that yet, but I think they're still working on it. Metro has kind of given up right now, saying it's too costly. And that's put rail at a real disadvantage. Um, but we notice on commuter rail now, we think the value of Wi-Fi is now past its peak and now declining. And let's ask this question in the room. Who here uses electronic device and no longer needs Wi-Fi, you know, for most of your day-to-day -day tasks? Anybody? Probably about a third of the room. My guess is in two or three years, it'll be two-thirds the room. So Megabus and other carriers had a real advantage early on. And we think the effects of that are declining as people learn to work without Wi-Fi with their 3G systems and their, their smartphones and so forth. But commuter rail, we saw a real surge this year. And I'll talk about the implications of this in a minute, uh, up to 48%. This is on, only on the uh, uh, Chicago Metro and South Shoreline systems. But we look at other modes. And we know that uh, both bus and megabus have been selling this tech-friendly amenity from the moment they were created. And uh, we call the, the trifecta really the four things, but the three things on board that you want besides Wi-Fi is you want a power outlet, you want leg room, and you want a tray table. If you can have all three of those, you're kind of in technological heaven, along with Wi-Fi, of course, if you need that. And Megabus and Boltbus offer two, universal power outlets, uh, pretty good leg room. You often get an empty seat next to you, and uh, Wi-Fi comes with it. Amtrak, you get everything but the Wi-Fi, um, and they're working on the Wi-Fi. But the technology is such that you need to, in effect, have multiple receptors on the train in which the signals get transmitted wirelessly to the different cars, and it's very, very costly on trains because of the right-of-way as well it tends to be far away from the... Uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, where the transmitters for, for um, uh, Wi-Fi service is available. So we saw this year Amtrak shoot by Megabus, as I mentioned, and the, the, the growth is astounding. Um, now this raises a really interesting question as to how tablets and e-readers fit into the mix. And I think what we have found is that a lot of people who previously would have quite settled for simpler activities, such as listening to music, talking on their cell phone, audio activities, have now shifted to visual activities, even, uh, even when they have relatively short commutes. And we have done some analysis on this. Laptops take a long time to boot up. They're kind of cumbersome. You've got to have a special bag for them. Tablets, of course, can be carried in a purse. They're quite easily to boot up. Uh, they're very unobtrusive. They work well in tight environments. So we see the growth of tablets and e-readers explaining a lot of the, the push toward technology. If you look here at the share of uh, passengers using tablets at a random selected point, you'll see that on airlines now, every one out of nine passengers at any random spot is using a tablet. And that's up from about one out of 13 last year. On Amtrak trains, the number is now 7%, you know, close to one in 13 or so. But the growth in tablets wasn't quite as great as we thought. We found that uh, there's been growth in all category of devices with uh, a decline in, in traditional smaller music players. And you can see on buses uh, and so forth, tablets remain somewhat of a rarity. Only about you know, one out of every uh, 30 passengers or so an inner city bus using a tablet. So what does all this mean? And uh, we've done focus groups for people. We've asked, how would your trip change if you couldn't use your device? What if, what if your train stopped and you couldn't turn to your device? What would your reaction be? And we expected to hear, I couldn't play my music, I get bored, the time seems to take forever. And one of the reactions was, when something weird or unexpected or bad happens to me when I'm traveling, the first thing I want to do 
is notify my friends so they know I'm in this situation. And it's like a way for me to feel that I'm not in public space, but I'm sort of a private universe. I want to tell my friends about it so they can commiserate with me or laugh at me or something. And we found that the, the devices were much more than just the activity itself, but it was kind of that sense of, um, of being in control, you might say. Being in control and be able to take charge of my environment and, and so forth. We also found that they said, was, was kind of interesting, is they, they just like to continuously check their, their texts and email. Even if they're not expecting anything to come in, they're very uncomfortable when you ask them to go 15 minutes without checking a text. I don't know how many people in the room are like that. I'm not quite at that stage, but it's getting there, I suppose. And we look at the, when you drive, they say, we, when I'm driving, I got to pull over every half hour and check my text. I cheat and check when I drive, and I promise I'm not going to do that. Um, car companies recognize this. Ford and others are taking real action to create you know, Wi-Fi type options in cars. But that doesn't help you much when you're driving. Of course, Bluetooth gives you some options. But we're seeing they don't really want to talk. They'd much rather engage in a device. And the talking part isn't really what they're, they're looking for. It's electronic connections that, that allow them to sort of multitask in this digital universe. Um, and on airplanes, what they say is, you know, the minute I sit down in my seat is the moment I want to use that device because I'm going through airport security. I got to keep it off. I'm walking through this busy terminal. I get to the gate. It's stressful. I get in line. I get on the plane. I finally can sit down. And then the announcement is made, ding, please turn off your device. And we have measured the length of that and found that it's about 14 minutes of time that you lose on average when the devices are turned off. So if you have a 50-minute you know, flight, that's 28 minutes out of 50, your device is off. And many people say, I just leave it off at that point because it's up in the, it's up in the bin and I don't want to get up. And so airlines we see have been a real challenging environment as well. And we came out with a report last week, uh, two weeks ago, and we, met, we estimate that the FAA ban is costing, resulting in around 105 million hours of technology use being disrupted. That it adds up to about 105 million hours, that FAA ban. So that study has gotten some attention in, in USA Today and others where we have, we have showcased that. But we look at all the modes together, which we're coming out this week, you look at the growth, and this comes out of our, really our bus study, of how much the different modes grew last year. And these numbers aren't quite final yet. We'll be tweaking them a bit. But you see what's happening. First, the great paradox. What is the growth of the bus industry in travelers? Short answer, nobody knows. There's no data on bus ridership. You can call Greyhound and Megabus and beg on the phone and once in a blue moon, they'll give it out, but they don't report it. They don't have to report it. It's a private, they're private companies. So what we do is we measure the number of departures. We take a snapshot of their whole schedule every year, and we put it in a data set. It takes us a couple months to get everything right, to sort it all correctly. And we found that last year, the inner city bus industry grew in terms of departures by 7.5%. That's huge growth uh, in terms of how much service is out there. Rail grew about 3% last year, and this is in ridership. Air had trivial growth, 0.4%, and auto mileage was up a little bit last year, but this year it turns out it's declined again. So we think uh, when I adjust these numbers to include the fourth quarter, auto industry, uh, auto growth will be even lower. So, of course, we don't think technology is most of the reason or the pivotal region, even, but it's clearly a major contributing factor to how people are making, making decisions. And air travel in particular is in an interesting situation because as load factors get higher, the travel experience gets more stressful. And ever since, even after 9-11, short distance air travel has been declining. And nobody quite knows why. We think part of it is security, but this decline began even before the heightened security began. Um, high fuel prices may explain part of it, but it didn't rebound when fuel prices came down. We think some of it is people are substituting longer trips for short trips. So instead of flying 300 miles for a conference, let's go to Hawaii type thing. Um, but we also think there's something about the competitive landscape, about the lifestyles of people and how they are connected and how they live uh, their lives 
that make both driving and air travel less attractive comparatively than it was uh, a while back. And um, we think this is a, a big part of the story. So uh, what does the tidal, personal tech tidal wave mean for transportation planners? Well, I just want to share with a few things here. Oops. Is First, we think that transit companies need to really leverage this. They need to sell that they are trying to stay on the technological cutting edge. People may not need power outlets on a commute, but they sure like to see them because it sends a signal that I have a safety valve for my electronic devices. You're conscious of my needs. This is a cool mode for people who are tech, technolo technologically savvy. Metro is now adding power outlets to a lot of its systems. Wi-Fi, of course, I think still has great symbolic importance. I think it has great importance altogether, perhaps diminishing, but it does have, uh, you're making a statement to your travelers. And on buses, it's relatively low cost to provide. And we're seeing more and more transit agencies explore that. Unfortunately, on commuter rail and light rail, it still remains a pretty tough thing to get done, although Boston's had great success with that. Uh, we also found that it adds the importance of getting a seat that we have studied buses and airplanes and found when, when loads get heavier, tech usage falls. Hasn't happened on Amtrak trains because everybody gets a seat and there's plenty of, of room. But on other modes where crowding's a factor, tech and, and crowding seem to be uh, on the opposite range of things. That's particularly true on airplanes. When you've got a full flight, tech use falls dramatically. Um, we also think, and this is you know, interesting how the whole commute pattern is changing as people become more dependent on devices. The nine to five worker is much less prevalent than it was 20 years ago. And my commuter train, I ride the Metro Electric every day. The less crowded trains are the ones right in the middle of rush hour. A lot of times I get two seats, no problem. The worst trains are like at 7.30 at night because they're down to the once an hour schedule and everybody's working late these days. And it's a very unpleasant environment. And we're finding that the tech lifestyle has created different needs for service frequency and, and different peaking patterns that trans agencies need to, need to take, in, uh, take in mind. Um, we also know that as people become more scientific in allocating their time with their tech devices, on-time performance is absolutely paramount. That the greatest tech environment of all, uh, which is the train, Amtrak, were they to have Wi-Fi and 100% on time performance, you can only imagine what their ridership would be doing if they could overcome that. Because, I mean, the very definition of the tech-oriented traveler is somebody who is quite sophisticated in managing every second of their time. When you throw in unpredictability in the schedule, it's a real problem. Um, we also think that uh, transit agencies just in effect need to recognize that people's perceptions of public spaces are just now different. That people no longer fear sitting on a bus that I'm going to have to talk to the smelly guy next to me. Or I'm going to have to, you know, I can, I can live, I can live, I can be me in a public environment without putting on my public face because I, I got my technological universe that's allowed me to create this bubble around me. And transit can be sold to people in the past who have been quite fearful of getting on public transportation. You know, every quarter when I teach grad students, there's always one person in the room, it seems, that have never been on the L. I'm just shocked at that. But there's, it's, a, it's a warming up to, to travel that the personal device becomes a clutch for people that is, is much more than just a practical instrument. It's sort of their way of staying in control. It translates as we think can leverage that much well. So my big fear is that this won't last forever, that this is the time for trans agencies really to sell this technological uh, friendliness because, in fact, we are just talking this morning about innovations in driverless cars and airlines are going to pretty soon have no FAA ban. We are working on that discussion. Uh, there is a lot of talk of um, cell phones on airplanes. Cars pretty soon are going to have, you know, voice activated systems that are much easier to use, that this is a golden era for transportation, uh, rail and bus, and we really think the data points that out. So thank you so much. I, we'll take questions at the end, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you.
Good morning. I'm Ron Milam with Fair and Peers. And uh, this particular presentation, uh, I've given it a few times, and I never quite know how technical the audience is going to be. So I'd like a show of hands here. How many of you are regularly using data, building models, or applying models? All right, some of you, OK. Uh, the, the topic is one that can be very technical. I think today I'll try and um, keep it a little bit more simple and give you a, a broad brush look at all the, the new big data that's available for transportation planning um, and give you some examples of how we're applying it. The title here, The First Penguin Through the Data Ice Hole, um, was uh, created by uh, one, of my, uh, one of my employees that was focused on the challenges of using big data for the first time. Um, when you merge yourself in big data, whether it's cell phone data, uh, speed data, um, satellite imagery, um, there's a big learning curve uh, because no one's really quite figured out exactly how to use it in transportation planning or traffic engineering. Um, so we're usually jumping through, hopefully, as the first penguin, we're not eaten by the shark or the killer whale, um, and uh, we'll survive to tell others how to do it, and that's part of what this presentation is all about. But first, I uh, probably need to give you some idea of what is uh, big data. Um, you know, in, in the newspapers, you might read about big data and uh, the type of work that we're doing. Um, it's very specific to a, a few certain sources of data, but I want to give you a few interesting facts just to get started. Um, the uh, $600 here is the cost to buy, uh, basically, a, a hard drive to store all the music that's ever been created, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, <laughs> of what technology has done for us. Um, the next one here, the, the 100 million, uh, this is referring to the number of people in the US estimated to have cell phones. Um, and we can track you, um, and we can build uh, models from that data. I'm going to give you an example of that. Uh, the uh, 30 billion here, that is referring to RFID codes that are put on every product that's basically made nowadays. Um, if you work for government agencies or you work for large companies and you have badges, how many of you wear badges to work? Many of those have chips in them that allow us to track you, uh, believe it or not. Um, and that's data that uh, can be quite useful in transportation planning when you're trying to uh, uh, figure out where people are going or want to go. And uh, I'll give you a couple examples of that as well. And the uh, 2.5 quintillion, um, that's the amount of data in bytes that's generated every day. Um, just an enormous, uh, enormous number. And this last number, the 90%, um, basically, of all the digital data that exists, 90% of it has been created in the last two years. Um, so big data is growing. Um, it's going to be a bigger uh, part of exactly uh, what we do in, in transportation planning. Uh, the biggest challenge is to figure out how to create something useful from it. And so we've created the wisdom pyramid here. Um, it starts with big data at the bottom. All this data is being generated every day. We're collecting it. We're storing it. But how do we filter it so that it becomes useful for the rest of us? And so there's a, a three-step process, basically, here, where we have to first make sure the data is being collected. Um, we then have to bring it into what I would call information. Um, and random data sitting out there, uh, you know, cell phone uh, data, that kind of thing. It doesn't really become information that's useful until we um, somehow organize it um, in a way that allows us to mani manipulate it, to analyze it. Um, so there is a filtering process. Once we have it in some type of organizational setup, oftentimes these are databases, um, there's this next step of moving it into the knowledge realm. That's where we actually do analytics on the data to help us answer technical or policy questions. Um, and so we get answers to those questions. Now, whether or not we act on those wisely is that next layer. And so to get to the point of wisdom where we're making better decisions from the data, um, that's where we're ultimately headed. Um, and each, of one, each one of these steps can be seen as a filter in the overall process. So the step one, converting data to information. Uh, these images might help you just realize just how much data is out there on people moving around, whether they're walking, driving, taking transit. There is so much movement on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's almost overwhelming to, to think about. Um, but uh, I think with what's happening in the big data world, um, we're starting to get our hands around this and we're able to start converting this into information that we can act on. So let's talk about some of the data sources. Again, I'm going to fly over this at a pretty high level. 
but I want you to get a sense of, of what's out there and what's useful. Uh, satellite imagery um, is, is one that's uh, quite useful, and I'm going to give you some examples of almost all of these. Uh, cell phone or smartphone data, in addition to just tracking basic cell phone data um, based on the data as it comes to the, to the towers, um, smartphones, there's a number of apps. Um, uh, how many of you have a smartphone? I'm assuming almost everybody in the room, okay. Um, yeah, most of the apps, when you hit that little accept button <laughs> uh, for installation, uh, yeah, there's likelihood that, that the data, your use, your wherever you're traveling um, is probably being tracked and sold to a marketer or some other type of entity. Um, and there's apps that you can, you know, set up just for the purposes of tracking your travel. Um, so this is becoming much more ubiquitous. We're getting more used to it. Um, and we're just now getting to the point, though, where transportation planners like me can get access to that data um, to help build better models or answer technical and policy questions. Uh, GPS fleet tracking data has been around for some time. Um, there's a number of different vendors that allow you to purchase this data. Um, we can also uh, get information from detectors. Most state DOTs, for example, have some way of measuring traffic volumes and speeds through detector data. A number of different service providers that are turning around and selling their data, um, Google, for example. Um, the RFID uh, chips I've mentioned, LiDAR is another way of taking almost Think of them as 360-degree um, photos. Um, and then social media I've kind of put into its own category because there is a lot of information that we share through social media that can provide you needs and attitudes towards transportation questions. Um, and I'll give you at least uh, one Twitter example of that later. So satellite imagery, just to give you an idea, um, there are companies like Remote Sensing Metrics that fly over the U.S. every day take photos. Um, this, the photos have to be from directly overhead, so it's typically about 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, each day. And this is useful for us from a transportation perspective. I can evaluate uh, traffic and parking conditions um, at some of these types of uses. They've gone so far as to actually forecast sales um, at these different uh, type of locations based on the parking lot utilization. But there's a lot more you can do with it. Um, if anybody's ever had to analyze the effects of a new Walmart, for example, and the effect it's going to have on downtown businesses, you can use this kind of data before and after to see how parking patterns change. Uh, so there's just a lot of different ways to use satellite data. And when you talk about um, this data and look at it from a parking perspective, um, parking can tell us so much about what's happening um, in terms of the economic trends, uh, level of activity. Um, there's also, from um, these types of, of um, photos, um, we've been doing a lot more um, urban land consumption analysis. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we're finding more and more sensitivity to, especially in the sustainability front, um, is how much of our urban land is consumed for transportation. Uh, so when you think of these large parking lots or you think of the, the roads, the number of lanes we have, um, we've done some analysis with this kind of data looking at suburban communities uh, in the western U.S. and are finding upwards of 40 percent of the land area is consumed simply for driving and parking. That's a pretty significant number when you think of all the other things we might be able to do with that land. Some of this comes from our parking and zoning standards. Some of it comes from vehicle level service requirements in terms of how many lanes. But when you look at it through that urban consumption lens and you look at a 24-hour day, um, typical uh, suburban roadway, you might be utilizing um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 40 percent of its daily capacity. We tend to drive on the road just during the daylight hours, and we really concentrate our traffic in the peak hours, and we size our roads for the peak hours. We size our parking lots for, for peak periods as well. Um, so this data can, I think, be really helpful in understanding and communicating pretty effectively to decision makers um, what's happening with some of the um, urban planning and zoning codes and, and the outcomes that we see. This also goes into our transportation planning thresholds. Uh, cell phone data is one that's gotten a lot of attention lately. We're actually building models directly from cell phone data. Um, one of the companies, AirSage, if you go to their site, they've got a lot of good information about what they do. Um, basically, they're claiming they have 15 billion data points every day, and these data points are allowing them to actually um, predict origin to destination um, traffic patterns. And they can even break it down by the type of trip, whether it's a home to work trip. Um, part of the way they do that is they know how long a cell phone sits at a, at, at a home, a residential area. They, now, they know how long it sits at work. 
And so from that kind of data, you can start putting together very robust models about exactly what's happening during the course of a day um, in a, a particular geographic area. And I'll give you um, one specific example that we've worked on. Um, one of the benefits of being the first penguin is um, getting access to this, this data and seeing all the different fun uses that, that can come out of it. Um, doing uh, modeling of origin destination patterns is one particular use, but I'll give you a couple examples of other things that kind of came out of it along the way. Um, in the cell phone data process, um, there's a lot of questions that people will have about, well, how exactly do they track me? Are they tracking me when I'm on a call, when I'm texting? Um, are they using just the cell phone towers? Does, does it have to be a smartphone that's GPS enabled? Um, the answer is they can track you very simply even without a smartphone. This is the basic diagram. I won't spend a lot of time on it here. Uh, but they can track you and they do a good job of um, anonymizing the data so they don't know exactly who you are um, by the time they sell the, uh, the data to someone like me. But if you want more information, AirStage has done a good job of documenting this. Uh, speed data is one I want to spend a little time on. This is becoming much more relevant in transportation planning. Um, be between the, the probe vehicle data, the fleet data, the detector data, we've got companies like Inrex and TomTom that are able to sell us uh, very robust speed data sets, even going back a few years, um, that allow us to quickly analyze an entire region. So if you're trying to analyze the operating conditions of your transportation network over a 24-hour day, Speed is basically one of the better performance measures to help us understand how that transportation network is performing. And it's very relevant for a lot of reasons um, because of how we can use it to measure operating conditions, but also its connections to other aspects of travel related things like uh, uh, collision severity and those kinds of things. And I want to spend a little bit of time on that, so I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, some other sources you should be aware of. Um, Anybody here use the uh, Google Transit feeds as part of uh, transit planning? Got a few of you in the back, excellent. Um, yeah, transit location ridership data is becoming more available, next bus, uh, the Google Transit feed data. Um, preferred bicycle routes, there's a lot of different applications for that, social media, Twitter, et cetera. Um, this is only growing, and so whenever I give this part of the presentation, um, I just say, whatever I say, I'm already behind because just in the last few hours, someone probably created something else. Um, so let's move on, though, to the creating knowledge part. Um, I think this is really important because applying the information to answer transportation questions is really the essential role here. And I've listed up some of the common questions we get asked. Um, you know, what is the travel time or congestion for an intersection, a corridor, or even across an entire region? Uh, who and why are the users of the system? Um, Will this solution work in 10, 20, or 30 years? How do we forecast conditions? How much will it cost to implement and maintain? And these last two, as we've gone through the Great Recession, we've gotten a, a little bit more um, focus on public transportation funding, trying to be wise with the use of our dollars. There's a lot of questions about how can we better manage our networks, especially if what people want to do is not drive, but be able to text and tweet while they travel between destinations, as, as Joe has, has talked about. Um, and then how confident are we in the recommendations? You know, a lot of the models that are built today to, to help us forecast what might happen in the future, U.S. practice has been that when we run a model, we get to give one number for the year 2035, what the volume is on a particular link. And no one ever asks us how certain are we about that number. So I want to give you just a, a couple little statistics to, to, to keep in mind. When we forecast, you know, 20, 30, 40 years out, um, the average amount of error that may exist because of the uncertainty in trying to predict that far in the future is about plus or minus 40 percent. So we could be high by 40 percent or we could be low by 40 percent. And in U.S. practice, we only get to give you that one number and we don't get to tell you about the, the really the wide range um, that might realistically exist. Um, it's a challenge in practice and I think it's something that we should put more attention on because we make some pretty significant investment decisions based on that 20 or 30 year forecast. Um, and in a lot of uh, states, the, the basic practice is also to forecast things like intersection volumes. What's the traffic volume turning left going to be in the year, you know, 2040? Um, frankly, we're not that good. <laughs> if we were that good, we'd be working for financial institutions. We're just not that good. Um, we're probably better at telling you do you need two lanes, four lanes, or six lanes, um, questions like that. 
Uh, but that's also important to bring into this because the models that we've built up to this point for forecasting are largely built off a lot of synthetic data. Um, we don't really know exactly who's traveling when through these OD type um, cell phone data patterns. Um, and I'm going to show you some of the differences we can actually see when we compare this kind of data side by side. So in the synthesizing data, um, this is a transit delay example where um, through Nextbus data, we actually have um, all the routes, the ridership, and we're overlaying that with intersection delay that's holding up the buses that are trying to get through this routing. Um, so here we have data that is traditional, the intersection calculations of delay, with Nextbus data about um, the, the routes, the travel times, and the ridership, and trying to make conscious decisions about the best places to try and minimize the bus delay as they go through these intersections by giving some type of transit signal um, priority. Um, so this is a, a nice combination of big data that's very simple. It's an incremental improvement on the way we've traditionally done things. Um, but it's done very efficiently because of the availability of the data. Here's another one where we built a uh, combination travel demand and traffic operations model using cell phone data and, and TomTom -tom speed data. And one of the interesting things about this data set was trying to understand um, how travel patterns were changing, where congestion was occurring, um, and making sure it, was re it reflected what the, the, the users experience when they're out there driving. Because this is for a controversial project where the people out there today that are stuck in the congestion, some of these red lines you see on the map, um, are very concerned about what's happening with uh, this particular interchange here. These red lines are speed data that has dropped down into the very low speed range. So this is congestion in the 4 o'clock hour. And in this model, uh, basically I can fast forward it to 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and you can kind of see very quickly here how travel conditions change. And so this was a, a model that was put together for a very large area in a very short period of time because we were able to buy from the vendor. This um, came to us through a company called Mygistics. We were able to buy the cell phone data, buy the speed data, have it delivered to us in a network where we could literally walk out to a public workshop after just a couple weeks and, and show this kind of data to gauge existing conditions and make sure it matched up with the experience of the drivers. There's nothing more that improves the confidence of our analysis with the public when our data shown in this type of fashion matches their actual experience. When you have models that show something very different, that's when we see the public have a, um, a higher degree of distrust and that can compromise the entire study. So this was a nice way to kind of get off on the right foot. The cell phone data for this project, this is what it looks like when you look at the number of, of the um, phone traces. So these are actual um, individual cell phones um, over the a period of about a month. This is the entire Sacramento region. Downtown Sacramento, California is right here. This is the city of Davis, city of Woodland. Our little study area is way out here. And we're trying to understand what happens at this interchange and who travels through it. Um, to do that though, these are all people that have traveled through that interchange. It's a regional um, interstate obviously, Interstate 80, uh, heads out here to, to Salt Lake. and this is the kind of data we had to be able to get to understand those, those travel patterns. That data turns into this. Um, it may look like spaghetti to you, but to me this is beautiful. This is origin destination pairs. Um, and you can uh, see different patterns here. Um, and, and from this, we convert this into a trip table of origins to destinations. And we build our model around that. So this is using millions of data records. I think we ended up with 96 million valid trip records um, compared to what we would have had through the, the traditional process. The traditional process would have created an origin destination trip table from really synthetic data that starts with land use to convert to trips, which takes those trips and distributes them based on trip lengths and, and, and mode choices. Um, a very synthetic process that we never quite know how accurate it is this is real data, real patterns. So much more, much more confidence. Um, there's also social media. I mentioned social media as part of the way we look at needs and attitudes. Um, this is actually uh, Twitter feeds. Um, we actually, um, Twitter, if you know this, um, they have free data. They, you can basically get access to people's tweets um, through their API. 
We can go do a little buffer around this transit station in Seattle. We basically did a very small buffer and said, we want to see any tweets related to the transit service, the buses, and this is what we came up with. There's a number of different, um, you know, specific tweets. Um, there's a couple I'll uh, highlight for you. All right, bus, let's see if we can make it home somewhere near uh, on time, please. That's an indication maybe the bus service hasn't run as effectively in the past. Another one, man on my bus, I'm broke, I just got out of jail, can I get a ride? Bus driver, sure, me, so scared. Uh, so again, security is another issue. So using the social media out there, whether it's Twitter, Foursquare, others that are push pushing the data out publicly available, um, there's a lot of ways that you can use this, usually through GIS tools where you can filter and look at specific patterns on a spatial basis. You can look at this on a time basis as well. Every tweet has a timestamp. It also has a unique ID. If I wanted to, I could track this individual um, tweeter um, to make sure they made it home. <laughs> um, you know, to see if they're still around. Um, but there's just a lot of different uses. And that's one of the fun things about jumping into this data. Um, you just don't know where it's going to ultimately take you. Um, as we've looked at the combination of social data and we've looked at some of the cell phone data, some of the things that have come to our attention with like transit systems. Um, some of the things we found on looking at the, the data is that when you look at along a light rail line, you can look at the cell phone data and you can start to see patterns of people that are traveling within the same corridor that the light rail serves but from the speed data, you can tell they're not on light rail. They're traveling, traveling much faster, for example, driving. You could market that area, saying, look, we know that people in this area are, are traveling to the same places the light rail goes, but they're not using light rail. Let's, let's target our marketing to that specific area because we know where the trips are going to and from. You'll just keep coming across those kinds of ideas as you dig deeper into this data. So making the better decisions part, this is the cell phone data again, this is that same, uh, same interchange, but a completely different use. You know, we're planning a new interchange or mo interchange modification here, and we ended up having some questions asked about a particular location. This is a regional mall um, with, you know, Nordstrom's and stores like that. And one of the key concerns about this interchange area and what's going on is, you know, trips to and from the mall because they can have a pretty overwhelming effect on these surrounding interchanges, especially during holiday season. And so we want to make sure whatever we're doing, we're being cognizant of how we're going to influence these, these trip patterns from the single biggest generator. Um, and the traffic model, this is what it tells us about um, the origins and destinations of trips and the distribution of them. Um, it says most of them stay within this basic area. Um, they don't go too far, and there's a definite concentration right around the mall. When we first saw that, again, this is building from a traditional traffic model, we, we questioned it um, because it didn't seem quite right. We knew this mall is the only mall for quite a few miles and, and that people come from an hour or more away. We also know the mall tends to have shoppers that come from high income areas, um, and this is not the highest income area. So this is the cell phone data doing the same type of analysis of the origins destinations with trip distribution added in. And you can see these heavy lines going off the map now. And this is true. This is um, going out to here is about 15 minutes away. We get shoppers from an hour away. This is also one of the highest income areas um, of the region. And you can see there's a very strong pattern between the high income area and the mall. Um, things that the traffic model just isn't capable of picking up on. Um, so again, having this kind of data either to validate our models and, and help make them better or to create direct models from. Those are a couple of the options we now have. I wanted to touch again on speed because I think this is very important to making better decisions. Um, when we look at this kind of comprehensive data, for those of you that use um, things like vehicle level service in your transportation planning, Speed is a secondary performance measure for many of the different types of street facilities, whether we're talking freeways or arterials. You can actually calculate level service directly from it. Um, so it's useful for the traditional uses, but I think there's another use that we want to think about. Um, and that's the fact that speed matters, especially in our urban communities that you know, CNU members are so um, interested in. Um, and that's because of what happens from a safety perspective. Um, also, there's a direct connection to emissions I'll talk about in a minute. But this is a, um, a graphic from the Caltrans Smart Mobility Framework that shows what the driver's focus um, is on the roadway and the distance at different speeds, 40 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour. This type of speed data needs to be brought into the planning process because 
the fact that your narrowed vision may pre prevent you from seeing the, the, the bicyclist here and, and, and contribute to collisions, not in terms of just what you see, but what happens when there is a collision. Uh, this is the uh, pedestrian fatality rates for collisions at different speeds. Many of our arterials, especially in suburban areas, are designed for 40 miles an hour or higher. Many of them are 45 or 50 and posted at those speeds. If there's a collision at those speeds, it's most likely to be fatal. Um, so as part of our planning, speed's becoming a more important metric, not only to measure how things are operating, but for our planning. We're planning many new communities using target speeds at a much lower um, speed rate to, to emphasize this particular relationship. Also, there's this, this relationship to emissions. Um, if we were to set vehicle level service based on trying to minimize emissions, um, we, as Caltrans does in California, they use level service CD, this threshold right here. Um, again, that's applied for the peak hour of the day. All other hours of the day, the speeds are going to be much higher. But if we want to minimize emissions, we'd be way back here, um, right at that borderline between E and F. Um, so speed, again, is this very important factor that was hard to collect good speed data in the past because it was expensive to, to comprehensively collect it for an entire region, not, not to mention just even a corridor. Um, now with the kind of vendors we have for a very limited amount of dollars, you can get that speed data and start evaluating these kinds of questions, whether you're doing it at the regional level, the neighborhood level, or right down to a site-specific level. That's the basic um, overview of the presentation, um, and we have plenty of time uh, for questions, so hopefully if you want more detailed questions, you can ask them now. Thank you. So I guess we'll, we'll open it up to Q&A. You know, one of the great mysteries of travel planning is just good data on how many people move from one point to another. And despite popular opinion that the U.S. government knows how many people travel from Sacramento to Oakland, there really is no data set for that. The last time the U.S. Census really did a good job sampling that was like 98 or, 98 or so, the U.S. Travel Survey. Are you able, with your big data, to start asking, answering those kind of fundamental questions, or is that still years away, you think? No, it's still going to be an estimate. So on the cell phone data, one of the things we have to uh, figure out is what is the market penetration. Um, but as you saw with the 100 million cell phone users, uh, market penetration is quite high. So when we first get the trip table from a company like AirSage, it is cell phone patterns. It's not traffic flow. So if you want to take a cell phone based traffic pattern data set and, and grow it to match you know, traffic flows, we go through a trip table estimation process. Um, so we have a, a lot of different traffic counts and, and we have um, some information about the, the population um, um, for that area and we know about the market penetration of the cell phone providers for like Sprint and Verizon. Um, so you can make a very good estimate using that cell phone data. Yeah. Um, and, and go through a process to validate to make sure that not only did it give you a trip table that matched the counts, but in our more sophisticated models, we also make sure it matches travel times um, and even queue lengths when we look at peak periods. So we're getting very good now at being able to, to answer those questions. It's still a multi-step process, but it really wouldn't be possible absent that, that good cell phone data as a base. Yeah, interesting, interesting. We have a question back there. Uh, yeah, I have a question. I don't think the data is. In fact, we continue to look for good data on transit, pedestrians, and bicycles. Um, one of our requests to the, the cell phone providers um, is to separate out the plain cell phones from smartphones and to actually stratify the data by speed and get the GPS technology to a point where we know if someone's walking on the sidewalk versus in the travel lane. So they're not quite there yet. <laughs> 
But those are the kinds of things that we are asking for because we want to understand who's walking, who's bicycling, and who might be on transit or, or, or who might be in a carpool even. Um, that's one of the other issues. Um, there's also data that comes from, I think, some of the social um, applications. Um, if you're a bicyclist, you probably use Map My Ride. You know, you know, getting some of that information, um, people allowing it to be public. Um, and there's, there's also, uh, I think, some efforts um, through places like San Francisco's planning department or through their public health department where they're also trying to get more of that data and providing um, uh, applications that, that you can self-subscribe to so that you can be a part of the data set. UC Berkeley did a research program um, a couple years ago where they had an app that they basically allowed um, people to download for free um, that would help them better understand their own travel patterns, um, provide them some information on, on travel times, and by getting that app, you agreed to share your data. So they were building their own data set for purposes of planning. Well, so we kind of have access to one. We're doing the master planning for the Google campus. And so we've built a traffic simulation model of all their employees, even them walking from building to building, not just getting to the campus, but what they do on campus. But Google basically is able to track every individual employee. I won't tell you how they do it, but <laughs> um, they can track every individual employee, no matter where they are, what they're doing. Um, and if I had access to that data for, for everywhere, to the point where you're not worried about cell phone data, it's more of a person, I don't want to track every person, but that's basically what you're doing. Um, you, you would know where people are all moving to and, and what modes they're on, those kinds of things. Um, that would be ideal, and we are growing towards that. You know, that's quite a ways off, but that's the clear pattern is as you go over time, the data is becoming much more robust to be able to track individuals. So we can do it now at many institutions or government facilities. They have RFID chips in those badges. You can track people. Um, and for major campus master plans, just taking that and expanding it to the local population um, with privacy controls in place. <laughs> Yeah, so unfortunately, it's not a consistent number. Um, when we were the first penguin for that uh, interchange project, um, the total cost for a very large data set that was covering the origins and destinations within a model area that was about 7 by 12 miles, um, and it had over 100 individual zones that we were tracking, the total data set was only about $8,000. Um, now, AirSage has a minimum price of $10,000, and they're also changing their pricing based on how many zones you have and how many people live in the underlying study area that you've drawn. And so they're still trying to work out their pricing model, and so it continues to change. I know their goal is to get to a, a smaller price package, like a basic package, where they could kind of pre-process the U.S. and map the data like at a census block group level um, and sell those pre-packages you know, it's smaller chunks, like 2,500 or 5,000. Um, but those are the kinds of numbers we've been talking about. Some of the studies we're doing right now, we've got a project in Southern California where we're buying the data for um, a, an area that covers a couple million people. Um, but we've drawn our zones kind of large because we're mostly concerned about big patterns, how many people are traveling within the area or just through the area. You know, that's a $20,000 data set. So that's the, been the price range. Same thing on speeds. Inrex and others usually talk about prices in the two, three, five, seven thousand dollars for a citywide data set or a countywide data set. Yeah, in, in Europe, the issues tended to be regarding the cameras. Um, 
And here in the U.S., because um, this data is not necessarily attached to the cameras, and it usually has to go, th well, usually it always goes through some kind of an anonymizing um, process, there hasn't been as, as big a deal. Um, and we've only seen, for example, at the Transportation Research Board conference um, last year, I only found one paper that really dealt with the issue of the, the privacy. Um, there were a couple of other posters that talked about it, but if you looked at the overwhelming number of presentations, that was definitely a smaller subset. Yeah, so um, the simplest ones that people have traditionally done, just using Google Maps um, and, and going in and, and converting the maps themselves into some type of, of, of data, and there's a lot of different ways you can process the data that allows you to quickly analyze what is pavement. Um, so in one of the ways we've done it, we've converted um, colors using ArcGIS tools um, to specifically be concrete or, or pavement. And then once you've converted the colors to, to that kind of data set, you can then summarize, you know, within the total area how much of it is of that color. That's one of the ways you can do it pretty quickly and easily. The satellite um, imagery, depending on what part of the country you're in, some of the Google Maps just aren't as good, and so the satellite stuff is a much higher resolution if you're trying to be very precise on that number. So if I was doing just very large area-wide, Google's probably fine if you want to get to the you know, a more specific area than, you know, maybe going to the satellite stuff is a good idea. The park utilization that comes from, like, remote sensing? Yeah. yeah, so what they're doing is they're just counting the number of cars versus the, you know, the number of... No, they, they have their own technology for, for doing that. And there are other companies that can use video to count cars, whether they're moving or static. Um, that's how they do, you know, parking supply or parking demand studies. Um, Everyone's trying to replace the person just walking around the parking lot, you know, doing it by hand. Um, and there's apps, um, some apps for, for doing that where you can have the, the, the aerial image with the parking lot and it becomes digitized where you basically have the lot digitized. You can just go through and click on your tablet um, where cars are. So there's a lot of ways that have improved the efficiency of it. There's nothing quite yet perfect that gives you automatic parking numbers, though. <laughs> Sorry. No, AirSage is was specifically created to um, buy the the raw data from the cell phone companies and then resale it. So they're a venture, venture capital um, firm, a funded firm, and they do have a. As my understanding, they have a limited time frame for which they are the you know only ones to maintain the like they get the access from Sprint data, for example. Um, although I don't think they can tell you who the, the vendors are anymore. So they, they are in a unique position right now as the only provider, really, of that data. Um, but that term of their contract, I think, runs out. And I think what will happen is you get into 2014, 2015, you'll either see the cell phone companies themselves figuring, hey, this stuff has value, and we want to be selling it. Um, or you'll have other companies bidding for, for those same rights to access the cell phone company data um, such that they can, uh, they can sell it. Yeah, that's really interesting. And the, I mean, the real holy grail that we would love to be able to answer is what factors drive mode decisions per se. And the only way to do that we can see is giving surveys to people if you got, you know, good Wi-Fi, bad Wi-Fi. We did see though that um, Amtrak Acela has come closest to perfecting the Wi-Fi, and they've had some problems recently. Um, you say on your local commuter rail you've got it installed, but it's been spotty? Yes. Controversial? Yes. Yeah. At least spotty? And so the ra it's, it's surprising to me at the pace of technological innovation that nobody's cracked the Wi-Fi on train problem in a satisfactory way. Megabus quit advertising, we have free Wi-Fi on all buses to Wi-Fi 
provided when available or something so when it doesn't work they don't get 800 requests for refunds. Um, airlines, um, there's been real, the bandwidth is far less than on Megabus. I noticed that coming out on Southwest. You try to download something that's pretty poor. So the frontier hasn't advanced as far as you think it would given, you know, the just incredible pace of technological improvement. One thing I just wanted to point out, I forgot to mention that underlies what we're doing. It's interesting with your work as well, how as the, as tech becomes more all-consuming in our lives, how people's identification with an automobile is diminishing at the same time. And that's, I think, it's something I, I neglected to mention, that people identify their friends and their lives and their goals much more based on technology than what car you drive. In fact, among Ryan and a couple of our DePaul students, I can't remember a conversation in the last 10 years where somebody said, oh, you got a new car. Did you get this feature? Did you get that feature? That tech seems to have squeezed out a lot of that visual or, or emotional connection we have to automobiles. And um, we think that's something really for transit companies to leverage, you know, that young people don't think first of their wheels and transit as a, as a, as a fallback. Well, there's, there's a lot of interesting theories. One is that people associate driving with stress, that, you know, they're being raced to school at the last minute and it's crowded on the expressways and, you know, the family trip, driving was a fallback when you couldn't afford to fly and it, it no longer has that ticket to freedom sentiment that they have. That's a little more sociological maybe than me as a transportation person would look at. I think, um, I, I think I look at my kids and just the digital lives that they live, and I, I can see just the, and we have to regulate how many hours a day they're on it. You can see where an automobile is sort of out of sync with that, that it's sort of a timeout from my tech life. And um, I don't think things like Megabus would be with us if it weren't for technology today, be able to assimilate people into a, a bus in an exact time at a curb for people to be able to bring their digital lives with them. And uh, the automobile just has less of a place in that. Uh, this is the third straight year we're going to see per capita driving numbers fall. And this year it isn't really due to fuel prices. Fuel prices have stayed about the same. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank both of our speakers for being here today. That was very informative, and uh, thanks for your time. Thank you all.